أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad In our last episode, we spoke about the the character of Aisha. And we decided to dedicate a couple of uh, episodes to her because of the the significant role that she played in the early history of Islam. She's regarded as the most beloved wife of the Prophet in the Sunni tradition. And many Sunni Muslims often wonder you know, why is it that the Shia uh, do not uh, hold her in high regard? And we mentioned that we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we don't have anything, any, anything personally against Aisha. We mentioned that as Shia Muslims, we have certain reservations uh, because of what we find in the Qur'an and what we find in the Ahadith that relate to Aisha. So we mentioned that from Surah At-Tahreem, we understand that Aisha and Hafsa divulged a secret. They divulged something that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to be uh, discreet and confidential. The Qur'an, as we had indicated, clearly mentions that their hearts deviated. In tatuba ilallah faqad sagat qulubukuma. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them to repent because they had committed a serious sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't just say that your actions were a deviation, Allah says that your hearts had deviated from the truth. And, and therefore, Allah's assessment of these two and we're speaking about Aisha in particular, Allah describes her heart as having deviated from the truth. And we don't have any concrete evidence that that she repented. And therefore, because of that, Shias have reservations about uh, taking a hadith from her. We don't regard her as a reliable authority uh, to take uh, religious rulings from. We also mentioned that the title of Ummahatul Mu'mineen, that yes, Aisha is the wife of the Prophet, and some argue that the Quran calls the wives of the Prophet the mothers of the believers. And surely this is an honor for them. However, we explained that for a wife to be considered Ummul Mu'mineen, This doesn't mean that it's an honor for her. It doesn't mean that she is necessarily pious. This verse was revealed to emphasize and to highlight the jurisprudential ruling that essentially says that no man is allowed to marry any of the wives of the Prophet after his death. And there are some narrations that indicate that some of the companions of the Prophet, at least one of them for sure, expressed interest in marrying Aisha after the death of the Prophet. And this was deeply offensive to the Prophet. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies and He basically gives this title to the wives of of the Prophet so that no one could marry them. So this is essentially a way of honoring the Prophet. It has, it's not a badge of honor in the sense that this title implies that the wives of the Prophet are automatically pious. Yes, we believe that many of the wives were pious. However, as I mentioned, that Shias have their reservations about Aisha. Now that's with respect to the Qur'an. I want to actually, uh, in today's episode, I want to examine some of the ahadith that are found in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim, in the Sihah, that also uh, 
are seen as problematic according to Shia uh, scholars. And this further uh, strengthens the position that the Shia have that you know, we have our reservations about, uh, about Aisha. We don't consider her someone to be an authoritative figure uh, from whom we take the teachings of Islam. If you look at Sahih Muslim, particularly in the Book of Tribulations and Conditions of the Hour, Kitab al Fitan, Wa Ashratu Sa'a, there's a narration from Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar was the, the son of the second caliph. He says, قَالَ خَرَجَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ مِنْ بَيْتِ عَائِشَةً That the Prophet one day came out of the house of Aisha. And as, as we had mentioned, the Prophet had small uh, dwellings for his wives uh, and they were adjacent to the masjid. So each wife had her own living space. The Prophet came out of the house of Aisha. And he said, رَأْسُ الْكُفْرِ مِنْ هَا هُنَا مِنْ حَيْثُ يَطْلُعُ قَرْنُ الشَّيْطَانِ This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet comes out, according to Abdullah ibn Umar, he comes out of the house of Aisha and he says, رَأْسُ الْكُفْرِ The head of disbelief, the height of disbelief will be from here, from where the horn of Satan will emerge. So based on this hadith, it seems that the Prophet is referring to Aisha. He's referring to that house, which is a house that is the height of disbelief, which is from where the horn of Satan emerges. So this is one hadith. And, and I'll, I'll share with you uh, the explanation and, uh, that Sunni scholars have put forward to, uh, to exonerate Aisha. So that's what Sahih Muslim says. In Sahih al-Bukhari, again, Abdullah ibn Umar, he says, قَامَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمْ خَطِيبًا One day, the Prophet stood to speak, to deliver a speech. And in that speech, Abdullah ibn Umar says, فَأَشَارَ نَحْوَ مَسْكَنِ عَائِشَةً He gave a speech and he pointed in the direction of Aisha's home. And he said, هُنَ الْفِتْنَةً Here, from here is the fitna. From here is the fitna. And he repeated it three times. هُنَ الْفِتْنَةً هُنَ الْفِتْنَةً هُنَ الْفِتْنَةً مِنْ حَيْثُ يَطْلُعُ قَرْنُ الشَّيْطَانِ this is the place of fitna. This is the place of fitna. This is from where the horn of Satan shall come out. Now you may wonder if these narrations exist in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim. Why do Sunnis still consider her to be the most beloved and the most pious wife of the Prophet? Isn't this a clear indication that the Prophet is referring to Aisha? Now the, the justification that is put forward, if you look at the, the commentaries of Bukhari, whether it's by uh, Ibn Hajar or it's Na'al al-Nawawi in his commentary of uh, Sahih Muslim, they say that the Prophet was referring to Najd. He was actually referring to the Far East the territory of Najd, and he wasn't referring to Aisha's home per se. The, they say that the house of Aisha just happened to be situated on the eastern side of the masjid, and the Prophet ﷺ was pointing eastward, and he wasn't pointing at the, at the house of Aisha. You know, the narrator may have misunderstood or he was pointing in the direction of the east and her house just happened to be on the eastern side of the masjid. And they say that the evidence for this is found in other narrations where the Prophet uses similar language. So for instance, in Sahih al-Bukhari, 
on the chapter of earthquakes and other signs of the Day of Judgment. Again, on Ibn Umar, Abdullah Ibn Umar, he says that the Prophet ﷺ once said, قَالَ اللَّهُمَّ بَارِكْ لَنَا فِي شَامِنَا وَفِي يَمَنِنَا Abdullah ibn Umar, he says that the Prophet once made a dua. He once made a supplication saying, O oh Allah, bless our Sham, meaning bless Damascus and the people of Damascus, and bless Yemen and the people of Yemen. Now, of course, you know, I have my, uh, I'm skeptical of, uh, of these narrations because you get a feeling that these narrations were probably uh, possibly fabricated by the Umayyads to give more importance to Sham because Sham was a stronghold for the Umayyads. In any case, the Prophet prays, he, he says, Oh Allah, bless our Sham, bless Damascus and bless Yemen. Now some of the companions of the Prophet, especially those who were uh, from among the Bedouins, they said to the Prophet, وَفِي نَجْدِنَا Our Najd as well. And Najd is, you know, in the, uh, the east. So they're basically saying to the Prophet, you know, pray for Najd as well. Just like you're praying for Sham and Yemen, pray for Najd. And then the Prophet again, he ignores them. And he says, اللَّهُمَّ بَارِكْ لَنَا فِي شَامِنَا وَفِي يَمَنِنَا O oh Allah, bless our Sham and our Yemen. And then again, some of the companions say, you know, how about Najd? Wafi Najdina. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he says, That the Prophet said, from Najd there will appear earthquakes and tribulations and afflictions. And from there, from Najd, there will come out the horn of Satan. So Sunni scholars, they say, look, the Prophet is using the same expression, Qarnu shaytan and it's in the east. And therefore, when he was pointing at the house of Aisha, he wasn't talking about Aisha. He was talking about Najd. And subhanAllah, you know, this, you know, if this narration is indeed true, you know, this could be a reference to uh, Najd, because, you know, this, is, this was basically from where Wahhabism emerged. So maybe this is, you know, a prophecy about uh, the radical uh, Wahhabi sect that emerged uh, from that region. In another tradition, again, if you look at Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa from Abdullah ibn Umar, he says, قَالَ رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ sallallahu alayhi wa alihi يُشِيرُ إِلَى الْمَشْرِقِ Abdullah ibn Umar, he says, I saw the Messenger of Allah pointing towards the east. And the Prophet said, ha inna al ha huna. He says that this is where the fitna will be. Huna min haythu yatlu'u qarnu shaytan. This is where the fitna will be and this is from where the horn of Satan will emerge. So this is the explanation that, uh, that you'll find uh, in the Sunni commentaries on Bukhari and Muslim. They argue that these ahadith that seem to implicate Aisha are actually not in reference to Aisha. The Prophet is referring to Najd and the house of Aisha was simply on the eastern side of the masjid. Now the Shi'i contentions with this uh, you know, are the following. In those ahadith, where the Prophet ﷺ points to the house of Aisha, or when he comes out and he speaks about, you know, Ra'sul Kufr, and, uh, you know, from here comes out uh, the, the horn of Satan. If you look at those ahadith, the Prophet uses the word Hahuna. From here will come out the horn of Satan. Now, in Arabic, when you use these demonstrative pronouns, you use them to refer to things that are close. If the Prophet was indeed referring to a territory that was hundreds of miles away, the Prophet would have said, Hunak, from there will come out the horn of Satan. But the Prophet didn't say from there, 
He said, from here. And therefore, if you reflect on the demonstrative pronouns being used, the Prophet is being very clear that he's referring to something that is close, not something that is different, uh, that is uh, distant. And we can also say that if those ahadith that refer to Najd as being the place of fitna and the place from which the horn of Satan will emerge, these narrations are not mutually exclusive. The Prophet could have referred to Najd as a place of tribulation, as a place of fitna, as a place that will, uh, that from where the horn of Satan will emerge. And the Prophet can also uh, refer to the house of Aisha as a source of fitna. You know, they both can be true. They're not, they're, they don't need to be mutually exclusive. And in fact, when you look at what transpired after the death of the Prophet, if you look at all of the wives of the Prophet, which wife of the Prophet was the only wife that actually became a source of fitna for the Muslims? It's Aish. Aish is the only wife of the Prophet who participated in a military campaign against the rightful Khalifa of her time. Even Sunnis recognized that she committed a major sin by fighting Amir al Mu'mineen. So indeed, you know, she is responsible for the deaths of many companions. A lot of innocent blood was shed because of the fitna that happened. Many people lost their lives in the, the Battle of Jemen. So the historical records show that Aisha was indeed a source of fitna after the death of the Prophet. She waged a war against the commander of the faithful. Thousands upon thousands were killed in that battle. So there's nothing far-fetched about saying that, yes, the house of Aisha was the house of fitna. And we don't need to say, oh, the Prophet was referring to Najd, and he's not referring to Aisha. They don't need to be mutually exclusive. And most importantly, the Prophet is an eloquent speaker of the Arabic language. He doesn't say hunak, that from there will emerge the horn of Satan. The Prophet ﷺ, what does he say? Ha huna, from here. And in Arabic, when you say ha huna, you're referring to something that is in close proximity, not something that is uh, distant. Now, we come to another set. So this is another problem with the reliability and the credibility of Aisha. So if there is someone, even if we had doubt, at the very least, we can say that we don't know if the Prophet meant Aisha or not. Now, if I have doubt whether someone was, was identified by the Prophet as a source of fitna and from their household the horn of Satan will emerge, at the very least... Wisdom and logic would dictate that we should have reservations. If even there is a possibility that they may be a source of fitna, if there is even a possibility that they may be ra'sul kufr, this warrants caution, especially when it comes to matters of our deen. So when you couple this, when you couple these ahadith with the verses of Surah At-Tahrim, Shias should not be blamed for having reservations about Aisha. They should not be blamed for being cautious about what she reports. Furthermore, when you look at Sahih al-Bukhari, there, there are some narrations that report an incident that took place whereby the Prophet rebukes Aisha by calling her one of, by likening her to the female companions of Prophet Yusuf. Now, what is this incident all about? There are many narrations that mention this, but I'll just mention the narration that's found in Bukhari, at least one of them. So the narration says that the Prophet ﷺ, according to the Sunni uh, version of the story, when the Prophet was, you know, was on his deathbed, he was too ill to lead the congregational prayers. So the Prophet ﷺ, said to Aisha, Muri Aba Bakrin Yusalli bin Nas. So according to the Sunni version of the story, the Prophet was ill, he was not able to lead the prayer, and he says to his daughter, his wife Aisha, command your father Abu Bakr to lead the prayer. 
So Aisha said, قَالَتْ إِنَّهُ رَجُلٌ أَسِيف That, you know, Abu Bakr is a soft-hearted person. مَتَى يَقُمْ مَقَامَكْ أَرَقَّ Whenever he stands in your place, he will weep. You know, if, if, if my father stands and he leads prayer and he recognizes that he's standing in your mihrab, he'll be overtaken with emotion and he'll begin to cry. And you know, I don't, I don't want to, and it seems that she, she didn't want her father to be in a position where he cries. She was concerned about her father's uh, reputation and his well-being. So the hadith says that the Prophet repeated the same order two, three, four times. And then apparently Aisha was reluctant. And then the Prophet said to her, إِنَّ كُنَّا صَوَاحِبُ يُوسُفْ That you, meaning Aisha and maybe the other wives who were in agreement with her, that you are like the female companions of Yusuf. Order Abu Bakr to lead the prayer. Now, that's the Sunni version. The Sunni version is that the Prophet wanted Abu Bakr to lead. He told Aisha, tell your father to lead prayer. But she was reluctant and she was saying that my father is emotional. The Prophet got angry at her and he said to her that you are like the female companions of Yusuf. The Shia version is what? The Prophet was ill. He was on his deathbed. He was un un unable to lead the Jama'ah prayer. Aisha overheard that Rasulullah is unable to lead the Jama'ah. And he wanted to appoint someone to lead. Without any instructions for the Prophet, she took it upon herself and she told her father, go and lead the prayer. So she wanted to take advantage of the situation and promote her father without consulting with the Prophet, to do it behind the Prophet's back. The Prophet ﷺ, when he learned that Abu Bakr had gone to the masjid to lead, the Prophet became so furious that he commanded Ali, imagine he's on his deathbed, he, he can't stand on his own. He commands Ali and Al-Fadl ibn, ibn al-Abbas to lead, to carry him to the masjid and he leads the prayer. He pushes Abu Bakr aside and he leads the prayer sitting. So these are the two versions. But both versions mention that the Prophet was frustrated with Aisha and he says to her, you are like the female companions of Yusuf. Now question, when the Prophet ﷺ says to Aisha that you are like Salahibu Yusuf, that you are like the female companions of Yusuf, is the Prophet praising her or is he rebuking her? To understand who, what, what is meant by the female companions of Yusuf, we have to go to the Qur'an. What does the Qur'an tell us about the female companions of Yusuf. In Surah Yusuf, verse 12, uh, Surah 12, verse 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَقَالَ نِسْوَةٌ فِي الْمَدِينَ مْرَأَةُ الْعَزِيزِ تُرَاوِدُ فَتَاهَا عَنْ نَفْسِهِ And the women in the city, they said, the wife of the Aziz, Zulaykha, the wife of the Aziz, is seeking to, re to seduce her slave boy. You know, people were slandering, slandering her, they were shaming her because you know it was frowned upon in that society for a woman of status to be infatuated by a slave. قَدْ شَغَفَهَا حُبًّا إِنَّا لَنَرَاهَا فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ She has become impassioned. He has impassioned her with love. Indeed, we see her to be in clear error. So they were criticizing uh, Zulaykha. So what does Zulaykha do? She invites them to the palace for a banquet. When she heard of their scheming, when she heard that they were blaming her, she sent for them and prepared for them a banquet. And she gave each of them a knife. And then she said to Yusuf, And she told Yusuf, come out. فَلَمَّا رَأَيْنَهُ أَكْبَرْنَا When they saw Yusuf, they admired him. They were taken by his 
appearance and they started to cut their fingers they said that this is not a human being this is a noble angel they were mesmerized by his uh, his attractiveness and this is where, where this is where Zuleikha says قَالَتْ فَذَلِكُنَّ الَّذِي لُمْتُنِّ فِي That you were blaming me about being infatuated by this young man. وَلَقَدْ رَاوَتْتُهُ عَنْ نَفْسِ And I certainly sought to seduce him. فَاعْتَصَمَ But he refused. وَلَئِنْ لَمْ يَفْعَلْ مَا آمُرُهُ لَيُسْ لَيُسْجَنَنَّ وَلَيَكُونَ مِنَ الصَّاغِنِينَ If he does not succumb, and he does not uh, respond to me, I will imprison him, and he will be of those debased. Now here, what do we understand from the female companions of Yusuf, who are actually the, the, the women who uh, Zuleikha invited? And of course, Zuleikha is one of them. The entire Quranic story highlights that these females... They were basically, Zuleikha wanted to justify her sin. She wanted to justify her sin that, you know, don't blame me. So Zuleikha and these female friends, they were committing an act of disobedience to Allah. They were trying to justify something that was haram. And in fact, after this incident, Yusuf went to prison. So you have Zuleikha and these females essentially justifying their sin against Yusuf. Now, Sunni scholars will say that what the Prophet meant when he said to Aisha that you are like the female companions of Yusuf is that in the same way that Zuleikha was trying to protect her reputation, Aisha was trying to protect the reputation of her father. Now, this is the explanation that is given, but frankly, that's not a very strong argument. Why would the Prophet compare her to the female companions of Yusuf? There, there's so much disconnect that if, it, that, yes, Zuleikha was trying to protect her own reputation, but at the end of the day, this is a story about a woman who was trying to justify her sin. And she was being encouraged by these women. And Yusuf ends up in prison. The Prophet couldn't have used a better example. So this shows us that the Shi'i narrative makes more sense. That Aisha, again, did something that went against the order of the Prophet. She committed an act of disobedience. And she tried to justify that act of disobedience by saying that, oh, the Prophet is sick and I just wanted someone to lead prayer. But the Prophet ﷺ, that's not your job. You don't have the authority to appoint someone in the place of the Prophet. So stop justifying your sin in the same way that Zuleikha tried to justify her sin. This is, this is what uh, Shia scholars say. And even if, even if you look at this statement objectively, it's very clear that the Prophet is not praising her. The Prophet is using strong language to rebuke Aisha when he says that you are like the female companions of Yusuf. I don't think anyone could consider that a compliment or a remark of praise. Clearly the Prophet ﷺ was rebuking her. And these are in his last days. So someone who is criticized and rebuked by Allah in Surah At-Tahreem, Someone whom the Prophet, when he points to her house, says, from here the horn of Satan will emerge. Someone whom the Prophet describes as a woman who is likened, who is like the female companions of Yusuf, of course Shia Muslims are going to have reservations about, about Aisha. Now furthermore, and there are many examples of, of problematic uh, narrations from Aisha, and especially when we're talking about narrations because there are a whole set of narrations where Aisha gives very sensitive information about her private life with the Prophet 
information that truly damages the reputation of the Prophet, things that no wife, that no husband would uh, be okay with. So for example, this narration again is in, is in Bukhari. Aisha, she says, أَنَّ أَبَا بَكْرٍ دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا That Abu Bakr, her father, came to visit. وَالنَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِ عِنْدَهَا يَوْمَ فِطْرٍ أَوْ أَضْحَى The Prophet was with, according to this narration in Bukhari, the Prophet was with Aisha on Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha, one of the two Eids. وَعِنْدَهَا قَيْنَتَانْ تُغَنِّيَانْ بِمَا تَقَاذَفَتِ الْأَنصَارِ يَوْمَ بُعَاثِ the hadith says that Aisha once said that Abu Bakr came to her on the day of Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha while the Prophet was with her and there were two girls. There were two young girls singing. They were singing songs about the Ansar, about the day of Bu'ath. So this is a battle uh, you know, during the time of Jahiliya. So they're, they're singing about some battle that took place on the day of Bu'ath. Two young girls singing in the presence of the Prophet. Abu Bakr, he said, Mizmaru shaytan even Abu Bakr was shocked. He was saying musical, so there's musical instruments and women singing in the house of the Prophet. Abu Bakr is, he says, the musical, the instruments of shaytan the instruments of shaytan and the Prophet ﷺ, he said to Abu Bakr, Da'huma, Ya Abu Bakr, oh Abu Bakr, relax, chill. Right? The Prophet is very relaxed. That you know, there's music and they're singing to non mahram girls. Two women are singing in his house about the time of Jahiliya. And the Prophet is saying that leave them, leave them. Inna li kulli qawmin eidah. You know, every nation has an Eid, and this day is our Eid. You know, so the the Prophet would speak about the prohibition of singing and music on the mimbar, but in his own house, he's okay with it. It's a safe space for for singing and for musical instruments. Does this sound like a prophet of God? So this is this again is another one of those narrations that uh, that Shia Muslims uh, consider to be problematic because they. They, they diminish the, the dignity of the Prophet ﷺ. So much so that even Abu Bakr was, you know, saw it as problematic. There's another narration, and this is probably one of the most uh, insulting narrations to the Prophet. And again, as I mentioned time and time again, we don't have anything personal against any of these individuals. What we care about first and foremost is that the dignity and the honor of the Prophet is, is preserved. Because Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That you are upon exalted character. So anything that contradicts and diminishes the magnanimous character of the Prophet, we categorically reject it on grounds that it contradicts the Qur'an. Now this narration, and forgive me for having to mention this narration, but we have to make our position clear as to why we do not consider Aisha to be a reliable source of Islamic knowledge. The narration is in Sahih Muslim. And the narration is from Aisha. She says, Inna rajulan sa'ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Aisha says, she claims, and again, I have doubts about this narration. She says that a man came to the Prophet and he asked the Prophet, عَنِ الرَّجُلِ يُجَامِعُ أَهْلَهُ ثُمَّ يُكْسِلْ هَلْ عَلَيْهِمَ الْغُسْلِ So a man comes to the Prophet, and it seems that he's asking about himself. He asks the Prophet, you know, what does a man do if he's being intimate with his wife and he's not able to finish? Basically, he's impotent. He's not able to, you know, finish all the way. So he's asking about intimacy. You know, I cannot reach climax. I cannot finish. 
The hadith from Aisha says that Aisha was sitting, so this man is asking the Prophet a very sensitive question about, you know, intimate relations with one's spouse, about his problem of inti- his problem of impotency. And then, according to Aisha, the Prophet he responds to this man by pointing at Aisha, and he says, "Inni la'afalu dalik ana wahade." That me and this woman, pointing to Aisha, we do the same. That the same thing happens when I'm intimate with this woman. So in this hadith, now is there any man who has honor, who would point to his wife and explicitly say that I have I have intimate relations with this woman, and the Prophet is also implying that I am also I also have problems of impotency. Allahu Akbar. Now, even if now I doubt the Prophet would ever say this, but as the wife of the Prophet, to share such a thing to the public, where you're basically compromising the dignity of your husband, imagine how any husband would react if his wife were to share this type of information with the entire Ummah of the Prophet. This is very problematic, brothers and sisters. So this is yet another reason why we have our reservations when it comes to this woman. There's a narration in Bukhari, and again, I'm just selecting a few, otherwise we would have to have tens of sessions on on, on such narrations. Another narration from Bukhari states, again from Aisha, قَالَتْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ سُحِرَ حَتَّى كَانَ يَرَى أَنَّهُ يَأْتِ النِّسَاءِ when you read these narrations, you don't know whether to laugh or whether to cry, honestly. Aisha, she says, that magic was done to the Messenger of God. Meaning what? Suhr, meaning they did sihr on the Prophet. The Prophet became bewitched. So much so that he was under a spell. Aisha says that someone did magic to the Prophet. They, someone bewitched the Prophet. He was under some sort of spell. So much so that the Prophet used to think that he had sexual relations with his wives while he actually had not. Meaning, Aisha is saying that the Prophet became bewitched and he had no idea what he was doing. He was completely out of his mind. He was not aware of his actions. That he was bewitched. How can a prophet of God, whom the Quran says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحِيٌّ يُوَىٰ How can we rely on the teachings of the prophet if the prophet can be bewitched? And he's reached a point where he doesn't even know if he, he was intimate with his spouses or not. He doesn't know. He's, he's completely unaware of what he's doing. And what's interesting is that when you look at the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Furqan verse 8, what does He say? وَقَالَ الظَّالِمُونَ إِن تَتَّبِعُونَ إِلَّا رَجُلًا مَسْحُورًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Furqan verse 8, He mentions that the evildoers, the zalimeen, they are the ones who attack the Prophet in this way. They are the ones who say that you follow not but a man affected by magic. Mushrikeen, kuffar, zalimeen. These are the people who attribute these accusations to the Prophet. They are the ones who call the Prophet mas'hur, that he's bewitched. He's completely out of his mind. And then you see Bukhari confirming this. Allah says, the zalimeen say, the wrongdoers, the oppressors say that you are following nothing but a man, nothing but a man who is bewitched. And then you have Aisha saying that the Prophet was bewitched. Bukhari confirming that the Prophet. Why are you attributing to the Prophet what the Kuffar have attributed to him? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala categorically rejects this. He rebukes those mushrikeen for calling the Prophet mas'hura. And then you have Muslims in their own books saying that the Prophet was mas'hur. Again, there are other narrations that 
are also problematic because they describe the Prophet as a man who doesn't seem to have control over his desires. And this is why we have a problem with these narrations. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 222, Allah says, عَلَى الْمَحِيضِ And they ask you, Ya Rasulullah, about menstruation. You know, are they allowed to be intimate with their wives? Are they allowed to have intercourse with their wives when their wives are menstruating? قُلْ هُوَ أَذَنْ Say to them, Ya Rasulullah, that it is harmful. فَاعْتَزِلُوا النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيضِ so, so do not approach, do not have intercourse with your wives when they are menstruating. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوهُنَّ حَتَّى يَطْرُنَ And do not have relations with them, intercourse with them until they are pure. Aisha reports, وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُنِي فَأَتَّزِرُ That the Prophet Aisha says that the Prophet would tell me, he would command me to be intimate with him, and he'd ask me to wear some cover, and he would be intimate with me while I was menstruating. Now here it doesn't mean that he was having you know, intercourse, but rather the Prophet was having intimate relations with her while she was menstruating. Now again, painting the Prophet to be someone who cannot contain himself, who doesn't have patience. And furthermore, now again, even if these things are true, a wife of the Prophet should simply say that yes, you are you are permitted to be to be intimate with your wives, but you're not allowed to have intercourse. Why do you have to go into details about how what how what the Prophet is doing with you behind closed doors? In Bukhari, Aisha also says, "كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله يتكئ في حجري وأنا حائض فيقرأ القرآن." That the Messenger of Allah would put his head in my lap while I was menstruating and he would recite the Qur'an. Again, why do we need to know these details? If someone wants to ask about a specific ruling, yes, it is permissible to put your head in your wife's lap when she's menstruating. Why do you have to mention the Prophet? Why do you have to go into these, these, uh, these details? And finally, and I'll conclude uh, with this, there's a narration where Umara, Ibn Ghurab, he says that his paternal aunt had a conversation with Aisha and she asked Aisha, you know, what if one of us menstruates and she and her husband have no bed except one? It seems that some Muslims were unsure about what to do when a woman is menstruating. Are they allowed to share the same bed? Do they have to separate their beds when a woman is menstruating? So here Aisha, again she goes into elaborate detail about her private life with the Prophet. She says, I relate to you what the Messenger of Allah had done. Let me tell you about how the Prophet was with me. She says, one night he entered upon me while I was menstruating. He came into my room. He went to his place of prayer. He went to you know, a place where he would, would do his salah. He did not return to bed. So Aisha is in bed. Uh, the Prophet is praying. He did not return until I felt, until I fell asleep. I felt like I was uh, very drowsy, and he felt pain from cold. The Prophet was shivering; he was very cold, and he came near me, meaning he came into the same bed. And I said to the Prophet, "I'm menstruating." So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa Again, we doubt these narrations, but nonetheless, this is in Sunan Abi Dawood. The Prophet says to Aisha, this is, this is what the hadith is saying, he says to her, uncover your thighs. I therefore uncovered both of my thighs, and mind you, she's menstruating. Then he, the Prophet he put his cheek and his chest on my thighs, and I leant upon he until he became warm and slept. And as if there's no blank, there's nothing else other than this way for the Prophet to get warm. Now again, the woman was asking a very simple question. She could have just said that, yes, it's permissible to share the same. The Prophet used to share the same bed with me when I was menstruating. Full stop. To go into all of this, if, if it's even true, and I doubt that it's true, that the Prophet ﷺ would conduct himself in this way. Again, this is sensitive private information between a man and a wife to make this public knowledge again is damaging to the reputation of the Prophet 
And many Shia scholars argue that it seems that many of these narrations, the, the purpose of them, the reason why these narrations are put forward is to drive home this narrative that Aisha was the most beloved wife of the Prophet. He was so obsessed with her that even when she was menstruating, the Prophet couldn't keep himself. He couldn't keep his hands to himself. He had to be around her. He was obsessed with her. But of course, this is doubtful. And in a nutshell, my dear brothers and sisters, to summarize, Aisha was a wife of the Prophet. However, based on what the Qur'an has said in Surah Al-Tahreem, based on the numerous ahadith that we covered, Shi'as are justified in being, in having reservations about uh, this particular wife, and therefore they feel that it is better for them to take the teachings of Islam from more reliable sources, like say the Fatima, like Amir al muminin like Hassan al Hussein, the Ahlul Bayt, whose purity has been confirmed in Ayatul Tatir. The purity, the the righteousness, the piety, the piety of Aisha has not been confirmed because Surah Al Tahrim clearly says that her heart deviated. We don't have any evidence of her toba. We have all of these problematic ahadith. So anyone who is serious and who is cautious about their deen should definitely take their uh, religious teachings from more authoritative figures whose piety is endorsed and confirmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, in our uh, upcoming episodes, we'll continue uh, with the, uh, the seerah of the Prophet. We'll speak about uh, the events leading up to the, the battle of uh, Al-Ahzab. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد uh, Thank you for the lecture, Sheikh. And uh, so a question. Um, so the question is like, I understand that Bukhari and uh, Muslim are just a collection of hadith and that in some, and I believe that in some of them are, the, some of the hadith are weak and some are strong. How strong are the hadiths that have been quoted today? So it's important to remember that from, from the, a Sunni perspective, there are no weak traditions in Bukhari and in Muslim. This is why it's called Sahih. Every hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari is Sahih based on uh, the, uh, the science of Rijal, the methodology of hadith authentication by mainstream Sunni scholars. Now you might have you know, some scholars here and there who have doubts about particular narrations, but by and large, uh, the narrations in Bukhari and in Muslim are not considered weak by Sunni scholars. So we present them today as, as evidence against them, as a hujjah against them, because they consider it to be authentic. We say based on these narrations that you deem authentic, this is why we have our reservations about Aisha. So none of the narrations that I mentioned would be considered weak uh, by, uh, by mainstream Sunni scholars. They might have you know, their own justifications like I had mentioned. They might have their own explanations as to what these ahadith mean. But the ahadith themselves, they are uh, they're considered authentic. I have uh, heard claims that Surah Falaq was revealed to dispel magic that was cast upon the Prophet. Uh, could you please comment on this a bit? Now, as for the details, I would have to look at the tafasir, but yes, there are some narrations that, uh, that indicate, so, and narrations in, in Sunni hadith sources that, that suggest that the Prophet was bewitched, as we saw in the narration from Aisha. And... Uh, you know, they believe that he was not immune from, uh, from that type of uh, witchcraft and sorcery. But, uh, but beyond that, I would have to look at the, the, the tafsir to find the, the, the detailed uh, story relating to Surah al falaq But yeah, if you look at uh, many ahadith, there are uh, narrations that, that highlight that. And, and as I mentioned, the, the reason why that is very problematic is that if the Prophet ﷺ is susceptible to that type of sorcery, then who's to say that uh, 
that what he's saying is actually the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who's to say that we are receiving uh, reliable guidance from the Prophet? So you essentially cast doubt on the Prophet's credibility and uh, his effectiveness as a, as a guide. The moment you say that, you know, he was affected by magic or he was bewitched. So then would it be accurate to say that uh, these claims about Surah Falak being revealed to dispel magic on the Prophet, that those are not generally accepted by Shia scholars? Yeah, yeah, they're not. They're not. Okay. And uh, f- about the hadith about uh, Prophet Yunus's uh, female companions. Prophet uh, Yusuf? May- yeah, Prophet Yusuf. Prophet Yusuf, sorry. Uh, maybe this is just like a bit of a translational quirk, but it feels odd to call the woman in that story companions. Because they weren't really companions; they just kind of were in a room when he was called in. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, com- and companions doesn't necessarily mean uh, friends. They were, you know, they had just happened to be. There, there was a, a so a group that happened to be uh, at, the, at at the same uh, in the same place at the same time. And this is this is one of the Shi'i contentions that sahib uh, does not uh, denote. Uh, piety. It does not even mean that they have this, 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 a shared uh, belief system. In, in, in the story of uh, Prophet Yusuf, you know, so Yusuf calls his, the two uh, inmates with him, his two companions. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that they're friends and they're buddies. They just happen to be in the in the same cell. So with uh, so Sahib doesn't necessarily mean that there's a relationship, a friendship. It just means that they are, they were acquaintances. They were together uh, at a certain time or in a certain place. But, it, but in that particular story, what is significant, what is relevant is that they all were conspiring and coordinating to, uh, to commit a sin, meaning that they were justifying each other's wrongdoing. Zuleikha wanted to justify her sin by showing these women that don't blame me. Look at how attractive Yusuf is. And these women were, were in agreement. They're like, yeah, you're right. You know, you know, if if he doesn't succumb to you, you know, you know, jail him. And this is what ultimately happened after uh, he refused to uh, to yield to Zuleikha. Uh, uh, he was uh, he was thrown in prison. So. When you look at the context of those verses, there is not a shadow of doubt that the Prophet was not complimenting Aisha by calling her, you know, you are like the female companions of Yusuf. I think any rational, impartial reader will come to the conclusion that the Prophet was rebuking her. He was not complimenting her. And and there's really no other uh, group of women who would qualify to even have that title, female companions of of, uh, Yunus. Yeah, the, 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 because if you look at the story from the beginning to the end and the, the story of Yusuf, there is no other uh, setting in the story of Yusuf in the Quran where you have a group of women who are in the presence of Yusuf. So it's referring to Zuleikha primarily and you know those women. And the, and the whole story is what? That whole episode was basically a woman trying to justify an act of disobedience. She was trying to justify a sin. Zuleikha was trying to justify a sin. And Shi'i scholars are saying that Aisha was trying to justify a sin. That, oh, the Prophet is sick, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, command my father to lead prayer. Oh, the Prophet can't lead, so I, I'm... You're trying to justify a sin. You don't have the authority to appoint who leads the Jama'a prayer when the Prophet's ill. So you see, you see the, uh, you know, how those uh, two are connected. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and uh, the hadith about um, Najd uh, being the place where the Prophet was potentially pointing to uh, as the source of evil. Uh, what is the, do, do we have hadith, uh, Shia hadith along those lines as well? I believe we do. I would have to check, but I, I believe that we do have uh, narrations that, uh, that point to that region as a place of fitna. And, uh, and some Shi'i scholars uh, would argue that that uh, one of the manifestations, one of the fulfillments of that prophecy is, you know, the, the, uh, the rise of Wahhabism. 
So uh, that could be one manifestation of that uh, one uh, prophecy that was uh, was fulfilled. But who knows? Maybe in the future uh, we will continue to see fitna from that region. And and one could even argue that we're seeing we're seeing fitna from that region today. You know, Najd is is uh, is a place that is basically uh, modern day Saudi Arabia, and you know we live in a time where the number of hujjaj have been restricted because of covid but when muhammad bin salman wants to kind of you know uh, hold a concert no there's there's no limit to how many people can attend so yes we're living in it we're also living in a time of fitna so 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 fitna and it doesn't only mean wahhabis it, it also means you know the the corruption that we're seeing uh, from that region and uh the influence that uh, that that's having on the the two holy cities in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and of course Allah knows best. These are all you know guesses and speculations.